Is the Bible true? Is the Bible true? We're going to continue our series entitled God Questions. Last week, how many of you here were here? How many of you were here last week? What do we what do we talk about last week? Is God real? Pastor talked last week about is God real and gave different reasons pointing to the existence of God and pointing to why God is real. And today we're going to be looking at the topic, is the Bible true? Before we get started, I have one announcement that I want to make about me and the wife. My wife, not the wife. That's the wife. An announcement about me and the wife. If any of you are on Facebook, I'm sure you probably have heard by now, but if you didn't know, the wife and I are expecting our fourth child in September, and after three boys, we did get a girl. And it has begun because yesterday, guess what yesterday was? Yesterday was tutu and headband making day. So... I'm looking forward to that. I'm not looking forward to the second job I'm going to have to get to pay for this girl. But we're going to be looking today at the topic, is the Bible true? And pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. But this morning, John chapter 1, and we've heard it many times, and you're going to hear it again today. The Bible says in verse 1, in the beginning was the what? Was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Lord, thank you for your word today. Father God, as we, as we examine your word, as we examine the Bible, Father God, I just pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, that you would speak to us, that you would show us things, Father God. May I, be, may I communicate clearly, and may it be not me communicating, but Lord, may you be speaking through me today, Father. In your mighty name we pray, and everybody said amen. 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 John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We've all heard that before. Hebrews 4.12, you've heard this as well. For the Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any what? Two-edged sword. The Word of God is alive and powerful. Hebrews 4.12, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. See, the Bible was written by 40 different authors, 39, 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents in three different languages. And as you look at the Bible, it all points to the same thing, which in itself is an improbability. The fact that you can get 40 people over 1,500 years on three different, different cultures, different, different time periods, different this, different, and they could all basically point to the same thing is crazy. It's, it's improbable. You're not going to find that anywhere else but in the Word of God. This morning, we could go scripture by scripture talking about why the Word of God is true, why the Bible is the inspired Word of God. But people would say, well, you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible's truth, right? How many of you heard that that argument? You can't tell me that the Bible's true because the Bible says it's true, is their argument. So, okay, that's fine. We'll look at some other things. Let's take a look at some different stuff outside of the text of the Bible, and examine if we can really, truly believe what this book says. So number one, what I want to look at is I want to look at the historical context. How do we know that this book, how do we know that the Bible that we have today is what they actually wrote? I mean, it's 2,000 years past the New Testament, past when the Gospels are written. How can I be sure that the Gospel according to Matthew in my Bible is the same Gospel according to Matthew as in A.D. 40 or A.D. 50? How do we know that? As it's passed along generation to generation, there had to have been things that have changed. There's no way that this could be what Matthew actually wrote then, right? Right? I mean, it only stands to reason that over time, as it's being passed down, how many of you ever played the telephone game? If I came down here and I said, Don, Don, if I said something like, I like apple pie, and we passed it along, and by the time it got up to the balcony, it would be something like, John likes angels' blue eyes. Why? Because as something is passed generation to generation, 
certain facts are taken out and new facts are brought in, right? You won't play the telephone game. So if that's the case, why does it not stand to reason that as the Bible was passed down, that things would be taken out and new things would be put in? See, the, the first thing that we have to do is we have to look at how historical manuscripts, how historical texts are examined, how they're verified to be true. See, they look at three different things. Look at three, when you're looking at an ancient manuscript, determining whether or not this is true, whether this is what this person, person actually wrote, you look at three different things. Number one, you look at the time from when they actually wrote it to the earliest copy we have. For example, if a news story, big news story, what would be a big news story? Somebody. Huh? 9-11. Okay, 9-11. After 9-11, all these stories are posted, right? Let's say there's, let's say in, in our newspaper, let's say there's one story about 9-11 on 9-12. And let's say 10 years later, there's five stories posted about 9-11. Now, which story is most likely to be accurate and true? The one that was posted one day after or 10 days after? One day. Why? Because it was closer to the actual events, right? So they look at the amount of time from when it was written to the first copy we have. The second thing they look at is how many copies do we have that we can cross-reference each other to see if they're all saying the same thing. If I have one story and I have five stories, let's say we take these five stories and out of these five stories, four of them say the same thing and there's one that has a couple of fudgy details. Which ones are probably true? The four. Why? Because it's more likely that the one is incorrect rather than all four of those being incorrect. Do you get where I'm going? Am I losing you? Are you staying with me? Okay, so they look at the amount of time from, whether you're with me or not, we're going. We look at the amount of time from when it was written to when we have it. We look at the number of manuscripts that we have, and we, we, we then cross-reference them. How many of you know? How many of you read Shakespeare? Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet. What else did he do? What other... I don't, Macbeth, I don't really, I don't really know because literature was never my thing in high school. In fact, high school was never my thing in high school. So the whole Shakespeare thing, I have no idea. All I know is Leonardo acted in some movie. Um, Shakespeare, did you know? How do we know that what we, what we read as Shakespeare is what Shakespeare actually wrote? Did you know we don't have any of Shakespeare's original, Shakespeare handwritten copies of any of Shakespeare's writings? How can you tell me that? How do you know? Because they go through this process. Aristotle, anybody heard of him? Plato, Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, anybody read that? How do we know that these writings are what these guys actually wrote? Because they go through this process. They look at when it was written, how many copies we have, and the amount of time between when it was written and the copies we have. For example, let's look at Plato. How do we know Plato, what, what we have as Plato's writings are Plato's writings? Do you have that? Plato wrote, when did he write? He wrote between 427 and 347 BC. The earliest manuscript that we have of Plato's writings is from AD 900. So that's about 1200 to 1300 years after he actually wrote it. So Plato writes in this day, 1,300 years later, we have this copy, and we have seven copies that we can cross-reference and say, okay, this is what Plato wrote. And nobody today argues that what we have is Plato's writings are not Plato's writings. Next. Who's next? Aristotle, 384, 322 B.C., the earliest copies, AD 1100, 1,400 years after it was originally written, but we have 49 copies. So there's a little bit more time, but we have more copies, so it's okay. Homer, how do we know that the Iliad and the Odyssey are as Homer wrote them? Let's go. Homer wrote in 900 B.C., we have them from 400 B.C. That's only 500 years difference between when he wrote it and when we start getting it. And how many copies do we have? 643. We have seven of Plato's, 12 of this guy's, 20 of this guy's. And in Homer's, we have 600. Man, Hey, look, if, if, if we can be sure of anything, we can be sure that Homer's writings, as we have them today, are how he wrote them, right? right. Now, what about, don't put it up yet. Don't put it up. But what about the New Testament? How can we be sure that this New Testament, as we have it, is how it was actually written? Well, let's take a look. Don't put it up. Good. Thank you. The New Testament, when was it written? Between 40 and 100 A.D.? Okay, 
40 and 180. When are the earliest manuscripts that we have? Anybody? 200 AD. 120. Cheater. You saw. 125 AD is the earliest. So what that tells us is the earliest manuscripts, all these other writers who everybody will tell you, we have what they wrote, indisputable evidence, were 1,400, 1,200, 500 years between when they wrote them and when we have them. The Bible is about 50 to 100 years between when it was written and when we start getting manuscripts. 100 years! And you're telling me 1,200 years is no big deal. 100 years. Okay, well, how many copies do we have? Homer, we had 643. Plato, we only had seven. How many, how many, how many ancient manuscripts of New Testament literature do you think there is? Over 500? Anybody think over 500? How, over 2,500. Anybody think over 5,000? Anybody think over 10,000? Anybody think over 15? 20,000? 25,000 going once. 25,000! Go ahead and put it up. 25,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament that we can cross-reference and make sure that what we have today is what they actually wrote. Explain that to me. And for somebody to sit there and say that the Bible is historically inaccurate is out of ignorance, really, because they don't know this, because we haven't learned this. In Sunday school, what do we learn? We learn Jonah and the whale. We don't learn about 25,000 ancient manuscripts of New, New Testament. So we don't know this. So when somebody comes and says, well, it was passed down generation to generation, how can it possibly be true? We have nothing to back it up. But now you do. I hope you write this down. If not, watch it on the website later. It is worth shouting about. I'll take one. Thank you. All right. So how do we know that what we have is what they wrote? Look, historically, it's been proven. There is no writing, no document in the history of mankind that is more scientific or more historically accurate than the Bible. So do we know that we have what they wrote? Yes. Okay. But you still can't prove to me that it's true. How then is it true? So we have what they wrote, but is it true? Let's look at it. What was their argument in the New Testament to believe them and why it was true? We were witnesses. We were eyewitnesses to this. The book of Luke. Luke, who wasn't an eyewitness, but he starts the gospel of Luke. And look how he starts it in verse 1. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Verse 3, having carefully investigated. Here's Luke, who is a physician, who is a doctor, who is, is very well educated and trained to think, think critically. Here he's writing and says, I have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. And I've decided to write to you, Theophilus, so you can be certain of what you've been taught. So here's Luke, this doctor, this physician, critical thinker, saying, look, I've interviewed the witnesses. I've talked to everybody, and this is what they've said. Look at Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Peter comes out, and he starts preaching. And he says, Jesus, whom you crucified, did all of these miraculous signs and wonders, as you well know. Right? Right? Isn't that what it says in Acts 2? Peter comes and says, as you will know. Now, Don, if I had Don stand up. Go ahead, Don. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Live Church today. Don's shirt is blue, as you well know. What would your reaction be? What would your response be? Don, you can sit down. What would your response be? Come on. Uh, it's not blue. There's no way. That's impossible. No, I can see with my own eyes that it's clearly salmon. His shirt is not blue, but here's Peter saying all of these things have happened, as you well know, and 3,000 people get saved. If that's not evidence, how is it then during the 60 years after Jesus' resurrection that the early church grew faster during that period of time as any other period of time when there were more eyewitnesses to refute the claims had they been false? If they're coming and saying, look, Jesus died, he rose again, 
there would have been hundreds of people that would have been able to say, no, he didn't. Because my grandmama's uncle's cousin, sister's neighbor told me. She saw and she didn't see that. But no, the New Testament church explodes and turns Rome on its side. How is that possible if what they said was not true? See, they said, we're, believe, we we're eyewitnesses. We saw this. We saw this with our own eyes. And we could go on and on and on, but we got we to gotta move on here. I mean, it's really unfair to have me preach this in one week. I might just take a, a page out of Pastor's Playbook and turn this one sermon into a four-week series. <laughs> because we've got a lot of stuff to cover. And so turn your and tell them, put your seatbelt on. It's going to get bumpy. Here we go. So how do, we, how do we believe what they said is true? They said they're eyewitnesses. If they, if they were making it up, let's say they, they, they came together and said, hey, let's make up this story. It didn't really happen, but let's say that this is what happened. Do you think they would face the intense persecution that they did for a lie? Would they face martyrs' deaths for a lie? Over, listen, nobody likes to go down. Nobody likes to go down over a lie. When we were in high school, my parents would go out of town for the weekend. What would I do? Hey, come on over. The parents are out of town. You know what that means. And poor Jacob, John, John, Jacob was always the voice of reason. John, mom said clearly not to have any friends over. <laughs> Jacob, it's okay. Just go upstairs. Just sit in your room. It's okay. Don't worry about it. We're not going to do anything stupid. The house isn't going to catch on fire. Just go upstairs. We'll be all right. So Jacob goes upstairs. Friends come over. Parents come back. What does mom say? Walks in the house. Five minutes in the house. You had friends over, didn't you? What? I destroyed the evidence. You know, clear. I'm not stupid. Mom, no. Yeah, you had people over. How do you know I had? What do you mean I had? John, this dinner table is two inches farther that way now. As I swear, she went around the house with a tape measure. And if anything was out of place. And so what happens? Jacob, Jacob, did John have people over? And Jacob. Why? Because he ain't going down for my lie. I love you, bro. But I'm not getting grounded. And that was just over a week of grounding. Here they are facing death. And around every corner they're facing persecution. Do you think they would have stuck to their story had it not been true? Absolutely not. We could go on and on and example and example, but we're going to move on. What about contradictions? How many of you ever heard that? Contradictions in the Bible. What about contradictions? Some of you are saying, well, well, Pastor, this, the Bible can't contradict itself. Let's take a look. Let's take a look. Matthew chapter 20. If you want to turn there, you can. By the time you get there, I might be gone. You can write it down in your notes. I gave you just a blank sheet to write what you want to write. Matthew chapter 20. As Jesus and the disciples left the town of Jericho. Here we go. Left the town of where? Jericho. A large crowd followed them. Two blind men. How many? Two blind men followed them, saying, Jesus, hey, he's coming. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Be quiet. What do you want? We want to see. What does Jesus do? I think you got to go to the next one. There you go. What does Jesus We want to see. Jesus felt sorry for them, touched their eyes. Instantly they could see, and they followed him. So here's Matthew, leaving Jericho, two blind dudes, healed, boom, done. Mark, chapter 10. Then they reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. Same story. A blind beggar. How many blind beggars? One. So in Matthew, it's two blind beggars. In the book of Mark, it's one by the name of Bartimaeus. Now what's up with that? I mean, if the Bible is true, and if the Bible is the inspired word of God, and if the Bible, everything that the Bible says is true, how can there be two one situation and one the next? Listen, it's an eyewitness account. Matthew is writing from what he saw. Mark, scholars will tell us, is probably writing the testimony of Peter. So here's maybe what Peter said and what Matthew said. People see things different ways. 
But you have to look at not the incidental details of their testimony, but you have to look at the court of testimony in the court of law. If I call two eyewitnesses up who were witness to a murder, and I say, is this the guy you saw pull the trigger? Yes. How do you know? Because I picked him out in a lineup. Are you sure? Yes. And you saw him walk away? Yes. What kind of car did he get into? And one says, he got into a silver Grand Prix. And the next guy, yes, I saw him pull the trigger. Yes, I saw him do it. Yes, I saw him. He walked right past me and got into a blue Taurus. Well, clearly they can't be telling the truth because it was, listen, I don't care what kind of car the guy got into. Did you see this man pull the trigger? Yes, I did. Okay. You look at the core of the testimony. It's not about the incidental details because with eyewitness reports, incidental details might change from case to case. So how does this show me? How, how do I know then that the Bible is true? Look, listen, you look at the core. I don't care. Was there one guy? Maybe what happened is Peter, after Bartimaeus gets healed, Peter gets close to Bart. And as they're walking with Jesus, Peter and Bart start talking. So that when Peter's telling Mark, hey, dude, this is what happened. One day, we were in Jericho, and then we left Jericho. And dude, we were walking out, and Bart was there. And as we were leaving town, Bart got healed. And that's when Bart got healed. And maybe as Matthew's telling the story, Matthew's telling the story, dude, we were pulling out of Jericho. We were just, we were rolling out, we were right on the exit, we were about to turn, and these two dudes walk up to the car. I don't know how they walked up to the car, because they're blind. But these two blind dudes walk up to the car, and guess what? Jesus heals them. Was it one guy? I don't know. Was it two guys? I don't know. Was it 30 guys? Could have been. What do you say? I say it doesn't matter how many guys were healed. What matters is that Jesus is the one who heals them. And Jesus, working under the authority of God as fully God and fully man, heals these men. So for you to sit there and say, look, the scriptures, okay, let's say hypothetically, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all 28 chapters, all 30 verses in each chapter, everyone is written out detail for detail, that would make it so much easier. Then we could say, look, they're written the exact same way. No, opposite. It would make it harder. Why? Because then what we would be sitting around talking about is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sat around one day and said, hey, this is how we're going to write them. Hey, let's write it this way. We would accuse them of some kind of collusion. If you're in court and three witnesses get up and give the exact same testimony, detail for detail, the first objection that the defense is going to bring is collusion. Clearly, these guys got together, organized their testimony, and are saying it this way to try and prove their point. You want different perspectives. That's okay. That's not contradiction. The core of the testimony is that Jesus healed them. Don't get hung up on was it one or two people. I don't know. I went there. You went there. Matthew says one. Or Matthew says two. Mark says one. Either one. Take your pick. Either way, Jesus healed them. So, contradictions. I didn't do that for the first one, so I owe it one. Why are you doing that? Because over time, people have set up things to say, hey, look at this. That's why the Bible's not true. Hey, do you ever think about this? Contradictions. Do you see that? That's why the Bible's not true. And today, we're getting rid of them. So, Contradictions. Number two, archaeological evidence. Why is there no archaeological evidence of the Bible being true? Listen, the truth of the matter is this. Get out of here. The truth of the matter is this. If you are in Palestine, wanting to become an archaeologist, studying archaeology, training to be an archaeologist, you know what they teach you to do? They teach you to read this as a treasure map. It's the truth. They teach you to read it like a treasure map. Why? Because if the Bible says that this town is a day's journey from this town, and they know the location of this town, they will not spend their time, their money, their energy, and their resources searching more than 15 miles away from this town. Why? Because the Bible says it is one day's journey. So why am I going to search way over there when this is what the Bible says? The Bible is archaeologically proven to be true more than any other document in the history of mankind. Well, what about King David? If King David was this great king, 
conquered all these people. Why would there not be, you know, why would you not dig up some pillar dedicated to King David? Or with his markings on. Why has that never happened? Listen, King David conquered a lot of people, right? We would agree. He went in, done. He was basically God's ninja. Okay? So, so they're sitting there, worshiping their pagan gods, and all of a sudden, on the horizon, they see God's ninja coming. They know they're in trouble. So David has conquered all of these people. Why haven't we found anything? Listen. In that day, foreign kings would only write about battles they've won. So for this king to sit around one day and say, hey, you guys putting up that shrine over there? Yeah. No, move the pillar more this way? Yeah, like that. And then on the back side, can you write something about this is the year that King David whooped me? <laughs> yeah, thanks. That'd, that'd be great. That's not going to happen. So, okay, we haven't found, but listen, recent times, we found the Moabite stone. Has anybody ever heard of the Moabite stone? Nobody. Yes, you have. Yes. Yes. The Moabite stone. What is it? If you, if you want to know, look it up when you get home. I don't have time to go. It's a, they found this stone that's written from the, by the king of Moab, which is on the, on the shores of the Dead Sea. So he's writing this, and he's, you know, he's making mention to different people from the Bible, King Ahab, and you know, different things. And at the bottom, makes reference to the house of David. The house of David. There's King David for you. Okay, well, what about Jesus? What about Nazareth? How come we've never found Nazareth? Guess what? They found it. You know why it took so long? There was 11 homes. And you thought your town was small. He came from a town of 11 homes. They found it. Well, why hasn't there been anything, any, any markings for Jesus Christ? Guess what? They found it. As recent as 10 years ago, they were, they, were, they were expanding this prison in Megiddo, and they came across these ancient ruins, so they stopped, and they called in the antiquities, and they came, and they excavated. And what they found is they found in, in a corner of this settlement, it used to be a Roman, like a, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a base camp, like an army camp. So in the corner of this camp, there's this, there's this, this temple, and as they uncovered it, there was this mosaic floor. And on this mosaic floor were different dedication stones. One of the stones had, had, had the names of four different women on it. They don't, they don't know what that means. But the next stone, Ganius, also called Porphyrius Centurion, our brother. So this tells us that it was a Roman army camp and, and that there were Roman believers. Because here's this centurion. Our brother has made the pavement at his own expense as an act of liberality. Brutius carried out the work. It's so, okay. Hey, this dude, he made this floor. Awesome. The next one, the God-loving Akeptus has offered the table to God, Jesus Christ, as a memorial. They found this. So if you want to sit there and tell me there's no archaeological evidence, no digs that have, un that have uncovered proof of the Bible's testimony, you don't know what you're talking about. Not to be whatever. But archaeological digs do not disprove the Bible, only that the Bible was true. Let's look at just quickly what a couple of them said. And I'm trying to fly through this. So if I'm going too fast, I'm sorry. That's how, that's how I roll. I know of Dr. Clifford Wilson. I know of no finding in archaeology that's properly confirmed, which is in opposition to scriptures. The Bible has the most accurate, is the most accurate history textbook the world has ever seen. Dr. Jack Cottrell. Through the wealth of data uncovered by historical and archaeological research, we are able to measure the Bible's historical accuracy. In every case where its claims can be tested, the Bible proves to be accurate and reliable. Dr. Nelson Kluke, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which, clear, which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And by the same token, proper evaluation of, of biblical description has often led to amazing discoveries. Dr. William Arbright. The reader may rest assured that nothing has been found by archaeologists to disturb a reasonable faith and nothing has been discovered which can disprove a single theological doctrine. We no longer trouble ourselves with attempts to harmonize religion and science or to prove the Bible. The Bible can stand for itself. Listen, archaeology does nothing but prove the Bible. As you look at the, the, the history 
and the archaeological evidence, there's only one conclusion that can be made. Historically, the Bible is accurate. What it says, it means. And what it means, it says. And what it says is true. This morning, you can't use archaeology. You can't use history to disprove the Bible. What about science? Here we go. I only believe in science. I wanted to get that clip and play it. Some of you know what I'm talking about if you've ever seen Nacho Libre. <laughs> science has proven the Bible wrong. What about that? Has anybody ever heard science has proven the Bible wrong? What about science? Huh? How do you explain that? God can't exist. Mathematically, God is impossible. If you calculate the statistical evidence of God existing, it takes you to zero. Listen, listen, dude. First of all, you're too smart for your own good. And second of all, don't talk to me about science. Well, what about science proves that God doesn't exist? How does science prove that God doesn't exist? Evolution, right? And that, and that, and that, what it comes to? What, first of all, first of all, let's define what is science. Science is systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. So science is what we know and can know through observation and what? Experimentation. So you tell me that science has disproved the Bible and God does not exist because the theory of evolution says that we all came from one cell. Basically says that billions and billions and billions of years ago, there was this big bang. And out of this big bang, the, that's how the universe was formed. And matter was sent flying here and there and, there and everywhere. And over time, the earth was formed. And then all of a sudden, there was this living cell. Just one living cell that split and split and split and split and split and split and split. And split into now every animal and every living thing and every plant and every, everything that has life today came from that cell. That's what evolution tells us. And so, so you tell me that science proves the Bible's false because of the theory of evolution which says that there is no creator and that we have all just... just evolved into what we are now by natural selection and mutation and, and, and basically viruses turning into bacteria and bacteria turning into to, to, to fish and fish to reptiles and reptiles to amphibians and amphibians to birds and birds to mammals. I probably mixed up like three or four of those. It doesn't matter the order. It's ridiculous either way you put it. So, <laughs> so... So you're telling me God doesn't exist because evolution says that way back there's, there's no creator and we just, just by happenstance, everything that you see now was created, which is ludicrous. It really is. Well, but God is impossible. How then? How, so you're going to tell me that instead of this happening over billions of years, that in six days, God created everything. That's mathematically impossible. Listen, don't tell me about what's impossible. Don't talk to me about what's impossible. The Bible says that for God, nothing is impossible. The Bible says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Nothing has been made without Him. That's what the Bible says. Well, again, there you go, using the Bible to prove the Bible. Okay, you want to talk about mathematical improbabilities. You want to talk about impossibilities. There's a couple of assumptions that you have to make in order to believe evolution. Number one is spontaneous generation. Spontane what is spontaneous? Spontaneous gener generation is, is that something dead becomes alive. Not only that, but it only happened once. So way back when, here's this cell, all of a sudden, boom, so now it's alive. No creator, no intelligent design. So, so it's impossible for me to believe that God reached down and created everything, but it's not impossible for you to believe that life came from nowhere. 
you want to talk about impossibilities, let's talk impossibilities. That's fine. But don't try and tell me that evolution is a scientific fact because it's not. It's a theory. Now, am I saying that all evolution is, is wrong? No. I'm sure some microevolution, we adapt to our surroundings. There are animals that will adapt to a, sur a certain surrounding. I'm not, I'm not denying that. There are, there are changes that are made within species. Why do you think there are so many different breeds of dogs? The, there is some form of microevolution. But evolution in the Darwinian sense that we all originate from one cell is impossible. It's ridiculous. It's ludicrous. And don't, don't use that as an argument to prove why my Bible is not true. Evolution is not true. So spontaneous generation occurred, and everything has the same ancestor. Everything dates back to the first cell. Listen, here's my question, which evolutionists still can't answer. If viruses became bacteria, plants became animals, if, if amphibians became birds and birds became mammals, where's the evidence? If you're telling me that it's scientific that a bird turned into a mammal, where in the fossil record is this half bird, half mammal? Where is it at? Or where is this half plant, half fish? Listen, today there are more than a million species of animals. We have fossil records for 88% of them. Not one lick of evidence in the fossil record for transitional or intermediate fossils. Intermediate creatures meaning going from this into that. Not one lick of evidence in the fossil record. It is a lie. Thank you. It is a All right. It's a lie. Chipotle, here I come. Let's go. We're done. We could stop there, but we're not going to. Yes, it is a lie. Well, pastor, what about, what about all the drawings? You know, pastor, we see the drawings of, of the ape becoming the man, right? Come, come here. Yeah, I need you to put your Bible down. I need you to come up here. 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 I need you to get down, like, like real low, like this. You don't have to kneel. Just stand like this. And you stand a little bit taller and a little bit hunched. But let your arms swing. Now, you stand like that. Now, yep. And then just, just, just kind of, no, don't, don't bend. Just lean over. There you go, like that. And then, Don, you come and stand up here and just, just look humanly. Now, we've all seen this picture, right? And this is, this is the beginning. And slowly, we turned into this. And then we changed from that to that, that to that, that, and to where we are today. We've all seen it. My question is, where is the evidence? Well, pastor, we found these skeletons. Have we now? Have we? Listen, this guy. This guy is based on, on a creature that they named Nebraska Man. They found it in Nebraska. Now, you want to know what they found that led them to believe that this particular thing was a mix of an ape and a human? You want to know what they found? A pig's tooth. They found a tooth. They found a tooth and said, look, look at this tooth. It's got to be a half ape, half man tooth. <laughs> no. Later, real science would come along and say, this is a pig's tooth, dummy. So you can go sit down. What's the, what's the next one? Pill down man. Pill down man right here. My man. You don't know what you are. You are a cleverly done hoax in which guys took the jawbone of an ape and the skull of a human, fused them together, filed down your teeth, painted you with chemicals to give you the appearance of age, and then buried you. And originally, archaeologists came along and said, this, this skeleton, this is like 500,000 years old. This is incredible. This is insane. Rewrite all the textbooks. Listen, it stood, you just keep standing there, <laughs> stood for 44 years they believed it to be true until they dated it to between 500 and 620 years old. No, that's a lie. Go sit down. Thank you. Now, what about this guy? 
Homo erectus. Homo erectus, the most famous of which is called Java Man. They found in Indonesia. Do you know what the guy found? The guy found the, 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 the skeleton of a man and the femur of a human. It gets better. Not only did he just find the skull of an ape and the femur of a man, but he found the skull of an ape here, and 50 yards that way, he found the femur next to two human skulls. And this is Java Man. You can sit down, Java Man. Next, this isn't you yet, so hold your breath. Next, Neanderthal Man. I didn't get enough, I didn't get enough guys, get enough monkeys. Neanderthal Man. Scientists have x-rayed the bones, and, and it's like the last link between this and that. Neanderthal Man. You want to know what he was? Get down. You want to know what he was? He, he was kind of, he was kind of hunched over, so they said this has got to be like the last link. And you know what he was? They found out he was a human male who was hunched over because of arthritis. Congratulations, you found an old dude with arthritis. You want the Nobel Prize? No, I don't think so. And then finally we have the human in our form. Thank you, Don, with the salmon shirt. You can go sit down. But what about this one? This one is, is called Lucy. No, I'm serious, that's what they call How many of you have heard of Lucy? It's like this almost complete, like, like, like monkey-like, ape-like, skeletal structure. The only thing that's different is the knee joint. Because the problem with, you can stand up. Give him a hand. You didn't know, I didn't tell you to sit down yet. You didn't know you were getting your workout in today, did you? So, the only, the only problem between ape and human, why it couldn't? Because they can't walk upright, because their knee joints. They could do it for short periods of time, but they get tired because the humans have the only knee that allow us to walk upright, okay? So they found this, this like ape skeleton with like a human knee joint. This is Lucy. This is the missing link. This is what we've been waiting for. You know what they, you know what they, they found out? What they found out is that they, they found the skeleton here, and they found the knee joint, listen to this, they found the knee joint a mile away, 50 feet deeper in the earth than where they found the skeleton. And their explanation is that a dog or a wild animal would have come, just taken the knee joint and went and dropped it in a well. Now, you want to talk to me about impossibilities and improbabilities and the likelihood of something happening? Yeah, I don't think you can sit down. Thank you. Give him a hand. So listen, here's my beef with evolution. Other than the fact that it tells me God doesn't exist. My beef scientifically and evidence-wise with evolution is if everything has transitioned into what we see now, where in the fossil record are the transitional and intermediate forms? You know what, the, the, you know what they, they said? Is the thing is, is they say, they say scientists, will, science, they'll say evolution is changing. Evolution always changes. We find something else and then we, we, we go this, and, and we find something else to prove this. And evolution is always changing. Listen, I'm here to say, if you want to believe in something that is always changing, in something that is going to be different two years from now than it is today, then you go ahead. But for me, I'm going to put my faith in something that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Something that has never changed, is not changing, and will never change. Evolution is changing. What they, what they believe now is, 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 is it didn't happen over gradual periods of time. Sure, the, the earth is 450 some odd billion, or 4.5 billion years old. You know, that's okay. But, but what they believe now is macro evolution. And what this says is that it didn't happen over grad. It wasn't a gradual mutation into this. It was rapid. And that evolution would be going along one way, and then all of a sudden, animals went extinct, new animals were born. So basically, one day, a bird lays an egg, and a puppy is born. Now, my science might not be exactly correct on that, but that's what they believe, is that evolution goes and, and spontaneous, it just, it just it happens quickly. And that's why there's no evidence in the fossil record. That's how they get around that. That's why there's no evidence, because they didn't leave any fossils behind. It was just, it happened like that. Ridiculous. 
Listen, here's what Charles Darwin said, and this is what we don't hear in textbooks today. Kids, listen. Charles Darwin said, the number of intermediate varieties which have formerly existed on the earth must be truly enormous. What's he saying? What's he, what he's saying is, is the, the, the number of species of animals as they're going from this to this for, for it to actually happen had to have been just a ridiculous number. Why then is not every geological formation, why is not every mountain and every stratum, why is not every layer of the earth full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. So today I'm saying, where is that evidence? And Darwin's saying, look, if it doesn't happen, you got me. I don't know. And that's not all. He went on to say, and this is awesome, he went on to say, unless transitional forms can be found in the fossil record. I'm just going to let that sink in, because clearly we don't have any transitional forms in the fossil record. Evolutionists will tell you we don't. So Darwin comes and says, unless we can find these forms in the fossil record, the theory of evolution is worthless speculation. That's what Darwin said. My question is, where are the forms? Where are they? They're not there. Evolution does not survive by science. It is not a fact that can be observed or experimented upon. They tried to create matter. They tried to create life from nothing. They took the elements and the, the, the things that were present, that they say were present, and they say, well, a bolt of lightning could have come and brought enough energy to bring that to life. They've done it, and it didn't work. They can't go back and do it. So for you to tell me the Bible is not true because it's not observable, and it's not experimentation, experimentable. Jake, is that a word? You cannot perform experiments on such. You can't do that for evolution either. Why am I harping on evolution? Because it's a big topic. It's a big topic today because evolution leads us to the conclusion that God does not exist. And that is in direct contrast with what I know to be true. Amen. So that is why I'm spending so much time here. And students are not told the other side. They're not told that Darwin said, if we can't find these forms, it's worth the speculation. They're being taught that it's a fact. And that if you believe in creation, you're a lunatic. And there are professors and geologists and biologists at universities who are losing their jobs and getting fired because they speak out, not saying it's wrong, but bringing questions about evolution. They're questioning it and getting fired. That's why we need to know what we know and why we know it. So don't tell me science proves that God doesn't exist. If anything, the Bible proves by science that it's true. Let's take a look at what the Bible says about science. How many of you know that the earth is round? All of you. Okay. Isaiah 40, 22. We have that scripture. Isaiah 40, 20. God sits above the circle of the earth. How is that written thousands of years before it was proven true? People thought the earth was flat. That if you sailed, Christopher Columbus, be careful. Don't sail off the earth. But here is Isaiah. God sits above the circle of the earth. What's next? Jeremiah 33, 22. And as the stars of the sky cannot be counted, the sand of the seashore cannot be measured. The stars are innumerable. The first astronomers thought there's probably six to 7,000 stars. No. It wasn't until the telescope was discovered or invented that we actually discovered that, you know what, we can count the stars. So again, sci uh, the Bible is speaking scientific facts before the science even catches up to it. And I'm here to tell you that should God tarry and give us enough time that one day the science community is going to catch up to what the Bible is saying. What's next? 
Job 38, 16. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Underwater springs. We didn't know that existed until recently. What's next? 1 Corinthians 15, 41. The sun has one kind. The moon and stars each have another. And even the stars differ from each other. Every star is different. Everybody said every star is the same. It's just a big ball. It's, just, it's all the same. No, they're different. Next one. Last one. The wind moves in circular patterns. How I mean, you know the wind doesn't move in a straight line? We see on the news, we see pictures of the hurricanes and the tornadoes and the weather, the weather patterns move in circles, right? Everybody, just nod your head so I know at least you're awake. Come on, I know the, arche- I, I know the archaeology was boring, but this part's not boring. Wind moves in circles. Ecclesiastes. The wind blows south, then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. How? And I could go on. I mean, we could be here all afternoon, but I don't want to be. I don't want to keep you here all afternoon. How could the Bible speak to scientific fact before scientific fact was proven to be true? Well, the earth is 4.5 billion years old. You believe in creation, it's only 6,000 years old. That's impossible. I have this rock. This rock, I can tell you, without a doubt, this rock is a million years old. That alone disproves creation. Okay, you have a rock that's a million years old. Congratulations. But listen, let me show you something. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. And on the sixth day, he created man. Did, when he created Adam, did God create a baby? Did God create a little baby princess like this? No, what did he, what did he create? Adam was, Adam was full grown, right? 20s, 30s, whatever. Now, if you want to run down a rabbit hole, did Adam have a belly button? Since he wasn't born and he had no umbilical cord, we don't need to go there, but just think about that on your own. So God creates Adam. Adam is one day old. Adam is one day old, but it has the appearance of age. Okay? Right? Now let's jump ahead to John chapter 2. Jesus is at a wedding in Cana. And his mom comes to him and says, dude, she probably didn't call him, dude. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. They're out of wine. Jesus says, it's not my problem. My time has not yet come. What do you want me to do about it? So he told the servants, hey, take those six jars. Fill them up with water. Bring it, bring it here. Pour it out. Pour me a glass. What comes out? Wine. Water to wine. He took it. What did he say? Take it to the DJ. Take it to the master of ceremonies. Take it to the DJ and give the DJ glasses wine. What does the DJ say? Dude, this is the best wine I've ever had. Normally, they'll give the best wine at the beginning to, to try and impress everybody. And then as the night progresses, they'll give us the junk. But you, they have saved the best wine for last. Now, what does wine need to become the best? Age. Fermentation. So here Jesus comes, creates wine, freshly made, freshly squeezed, with the appearance of age. Six jars. Why then could God not come six days? Six jars, six days. I'm not saying, but maybe. What's to say God couldn't have come and created the earth with the appearance of age? The earth with appearance of age? Man with appearance of age. Jesus, wine with the appearance of age. Why could it not? I'm not saying it's true. I have no idea. I don't know if the earth is 6,000 years old. I don't know if it's a billion years. Listen, I don't know. I wasn't. If you want to ask me my opinion, disclaimer, this is John's opinion. In no way does this opinion reflect anything. If you want my opinion, my opinion is God created the earth in six days. 24-hour periods of time. The first day, heavens and the earth, and so on and so on. And so the earth, yes, is 6,000 years old with the appearance of age. So sure, there could be geological formations and rocks and such that test to later dates, but why could it not have been? I don't know. And the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter. In no way does whether the earth is 6,000 years old or billions of years old affect my salvation knowing that Jesus came, was who he said he was, did what he said he did, died for me, rose again, wants to be in relationship, and is redeeming me. In no way does that affect my faith and my salvation. So the truth of the matter is, I don't know. I know you were wanting some like deep philosophical, 
I don't know. But does it really matter? At the end of the day, does that really matter? No. It might be one of the questions we ask God when we get to heaven. Hey, what happened? I really want there to be a DVR in heaven. Like a DVR of time. That we can just rewind. And like Moses in the Red Sea, I just want to rewind it and just play it and just keep rewinding it. Stuff like that. Jericho. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. So, science. What time is it? Woo. Science. Last thing, prophecy. Prophecy. Prophecy in the Bible. There are hundreds of prophecies about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. Well, those were put there after Jesus left. No, the Dead Sea Scrolls predate Jesus' time to prove that those were actually in the Old Testament before he came. So, here's these prophecies. And you don't have to put them up on the screen, but he'll be born in Bethlehem. He'll be born of a virgin. Zechariah 9, he's going to come in riding on a donkey. And Jesus fulfilled all these prophecies. Jake, let me see that bag. Jake, let me see that bag. Thank you. So, what is this? What kind of coin? What kind? A silver dollar, right? Come hold this, Joey. Hold this for me. So, you've got a silver dollar in your hand. Correct. Now, what happens if I take this silver dollar, I put a mark on it, and I give you these two? Now you have two. Put them in here. Okay? So there's two silver dollar coins in here. Reach in and pull one out. What are the odds? Before you do, what are the odds that you're going to pull out the marked one? 50 50. One and two. Go ahead. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. No. Eh. All right, put it back. <laughs> so let's put three more coins. In fact, Let's put the rest of them. There's 10. Okay? 10 coins, one is marked. What are the odds that you're going to pull out the marked coin? One out of 10. All right, let's go for it. Winner! What does he win? Awesome. Congratulations. So, one out of 10, right? We all understand mathematical odds and, and probability and stuff like that. So, let's look at the probability that. All of these prophecies about the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus' life. Let's, what, are, what, are the, what are the odds that he fulfilled eight of them? Eight of these prophecies. What are the odds? Anybody? One in ten to the 17th power. What is that? That's the number. Those are the odds that eight prophecies about the Messiah were fulfilled in Jesus, that he is actually the Messiah. So what that's saying is that one in a giant number are the odds that he's not who he says he was. That's eight. You don't know how many you fulfilled? Over 300. Now let's look at the next number. What about 48? The chances and the odds of him fulfilling 48 prophecies is one in 10 to the, go ahead, 157th power. That's 48. He fulfilled over 300. Now, it's impossible for us to wrap our head around this number. There's no way that you could possibly comprehend that number. So let's just say this. You pulled out a March coin in 1 in 10. Let's say I took these coins and stacked them two feet high. Obviously, I have to get more coins. Let's say I stacked them two feet high. Let's say me and you get in a car and we drive south. Let's say we go to Texas. All right? We're in Texas. Ever been to Texas? You're not missing anything. Sorry if you're from Texas. So we go to Texas. And I have an unlimited supply of these coins. And I put two feet high of coins across the entire state of Texas. 700 miles east to west, 400 miles north to south, something like that. The entire state of Texas is covered in coins 200 feet high. And I tell you, there's one coin out there with a mark on it. You can go as far, as north, as south, anywhere you want. Go wherever you want. You can swim through them, but find me that coin. You know what the odds of you finding that coin are? The same, as the same as the odds of Jesus not being who he said he was. That's statistical probability. If you're going to give me those odds, I'm taking them. I'm not a betting man, but I'm going to take that. So you want to look at science. You want to look at archaeology. You want to look at history. You want to look at all these other things. Look, it all points to the same thing. That we have what they wrote... And what they wrote is actually true. Amen. The question today is, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? 
I don't know what you came in here dealing with. I don't know if you're sick. I don't know if you're depressed. I don't know if you're struggling. I don't know where you are, but the question is, what are you going to do with this? I don't know the questions you have, but I can point you to the answer. Nathan, if you'd come back. I don't know where you're living, but I can point you to the truth. You're sick. The Bible says that through his stripes, we are healed. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. We are more than conquerors in Christ. Do I need to keep going? What are you going to do with the truth that the Bible is real? Maybe you say, I don't even know Jesus. I've never been to church. I don't know. Listen, that's okay. The Bible says that he loves you. He sent his son to die for you. That he might be in relationship with you. Listen, the entire Bible points in the same direction that God loves you, that he wants to be in relationship with you, and he sent you redemptive power through his son, Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is about. This morning, the question is, what are you going to do with it?